Hello, and welcome to the 35th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malva Kajali, the Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming poet Joy Graham, who has curated a fantastic lineup of readers and luminaries for us today, featuring Claudia Rankin, Forrest Gander, Victoria Chang, D.A. Powell, and Jericho Brown. We've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgments. The first is that here in New York, we're on the Napahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsi, Munsi and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. If you'd like, uh, take a moment to share the land you're tuning in from in the chat and some observations on what it's like around you. It's gray in Harlem today. I'm right by the river. Uh, the second is an acknowledgement that Black Lives Matter. In the wake of the verdict of the Derek Chauvin murder trial just a few weeks ago, it's hard not to think about today and ongoingly the devastating violence and reach of systemic racism uh, when over 180 black folks have lost their lives at the hands of police across the country in just the span of time since Floyd's murder last May. This includes, of course, 16-year-old Makia Bryant, uh, who was killed on the same day as the Chauvin trial came to a close by the Columbus Police Department after she called them herself in search in seek of protection. Uh, it's devastating to grasp the whole picture of the violence and collective trauma of systemic racism across not just individuals, but families, communities, and generations. And so before we open up for our program, uh, I'd like to invite you to join us for a very brief moment of silence to remember Makia Bryant. Thank you so much. And uh, now it's my honor to welcome our curator, the wonderful Joy Graham. Uh, she's one of the most celebrated poets of the American post-war generation. She also gave me a lot of sage words on character and personality. She's the author of 14 books of poetry and the recipient of many awards, which include the Pulitzer Prize. And she teaches at Harvard and is tuning in today from Massachusetts, I believe. Uh, Joy, take it away. And Joy, you should be able to uh, turn on your microphone right in the... Sorry, it's not like I haven't done 10,000 hours of Zoom this year. Thank you, everyone, and thank you for showing up. Thank you to Fong, Malvika, Nick, and everybody else at the Brooklyn Rail for inviting me to curate this event. Um, I was extremely happy to invite these particular poets and grateful to them for accepting us. Our invitation. They need no introduction, but we decided to go in reverse alphabetical order and um, that each poet would introduce each next poet. And the event will last about an hour and a half. So invited to curate a radical poetry event, I asked our poets to meditate on what from the origins of our literatures and throughout our several civilizations, we have intuitively understood as the link between what we call illness of the body and illness of the body politic. There have been many instances in history where pandemics appear to be trying to speak to humans about the illness afflicting their minds, souls, ethics, and politics. The bad king and the sick state. It's in all our literatures and religious texts worldwide. We know this. We have always known this. And yet, what is terrifying about our moment is how brutally literal this has become in the darkness of pathological racism, politically aggravated pandemics, and a cruelty, injustice, inequality, greed, and sheer indifference that exhibit not just malaise, but a deep sickness moral fiber, which infiltrates the very marrow of our people and our democracy. The sickness of inequality has led to greater literal sickness afflicting our most vulnerable and discriminated against populations. The name of the sickness is that moral blindness we call so casually hatred. To the white supremacist hatreds, the structural, structural technology-fueled hatreds of truth, history, science, the past, to the hatred of the earth itself. We have to add our further descent into the contagious disease, which becomes finally a hatred of the future, 
We are killing off our children and theirs along with those of most other species. Each of the artists gathered here has experienced as have so many of our fellow citizens, the appalling wake up call we refer to as the moment of diagnosis. The phone call, the test result, the prognosis, the look in the doctor's eye if they are lucky enough to have access to a doctor, as well as the incredible desire to wake up from it as if it were a fever dream. But I think everyone here would think of that moment, perhaps in retrospect, as not only a crisis, but an opportunity. One obviously hoped to be spared. But slowly one realizes that because of the crisis, one might actually be in some other sense saved. The difference between being spared and being saved is one we easily fail to grasp, though it is knowledge we have knowledge which our poetry will try once again today to bring, if nothing else in the tone of the voices you're about to hear and in their courage and their wisdom. This moment right now seems an inflection point, a rare opportunity, because as we think we awaken from the worst parts of COVID, we have once again, the briefest of windows through which to see the real preceding and ongoing illness it reveals because it's not a new illness, God knows. The cycles of violence against black, brown, indigenous, and other people of color, as well as women, the LGBTQ communities, persecuted minorities worldwide, continues unabated in spite of outcry, in spite of witnessed atrocity. But perhaps we now have once again in our communities that brief window before we shut down again, thinking ourselves spared Um, before we shut down again, thinking ourselves spared and letting the illness again fester and worlds and humans suffer. It is no accident that the worldwide awakening of Black Lives Matter and the rising up of our people against an attempted totalitarian coup occurred during the worst of the pandemic. But do we now really apprehend the multiple racisms, injustice, carceral genocide, constant nuclear threat, threat, and the very real risk of the loss of democracy and planet. How do we try to stay awake when it is so much easier to go back under into the slumber once we feel spared? The imagination of poetry, as it always has, militates with all its force against that slumber, reminding us with every syllable of the urgency of staying awake, that's its job. Sometimes staying awake means rattling the cage, speaking truth to power. Sometimes it just means not avoiding living your life. Gander refers to this as being torn awake. Powell refers to this as sitting down to the repast of your mortality with all its courses. Rankine admonishes us that justice is nothing if we don't awaken to the fact that it is nothing if it is not just us. Chang soberly reminds us that there is an obit ready for every single thing we take for granted and hold dear, human creature, tradition, belief, hyper object. And Brown whispers, no one in this nation feels safe and I'm still a reason why. And to save us says, I think then of holding you as a political act. Please join me in listening to what they have to teach us about coming awake and staying awake. I know we're on Zoom, but if there's any medium which can make this a full body experience, it's poetry and these poets. And now I pass this off to the luminous Claudia Rankine, whose words and moral clarity and courage you all know. She is the author most recently of Just Us, as well as, of course, of Citizen and Don't Let Me Be Lonely, where she addresses, among other things, her own encounter with diagnosis and disease. Thank you. thank you, Jerry. Um, I, I just want to thank you for including me 
in a lineup I could not have imagined. These are some of the poets I most admire in in all of my life and in all of the world. So it's a it's an honor to have been included here today. I um, would also like to thank the Brooklyn Rail for putting this together. I'm going to um, read uh, a segment of a poem, prose piece written by the incredible Lauren Ballant. Um, she has um, been working on a series called Poisons and um, and so I'm going to read first a section from a larger piece called Testing Positive for the Funk. And then I'm going to read uh, another piece of hers that I've been working with. So it's, it's a kind of a worked piece, but it's her language. And then I'll read a small piece of my own. Testing Positive for the Funk. In a state of emergency, small things change that add up to new dimensions of space. I mean, on the sidewalk, we're trying not to trip over each other from six feet apart. We're all in it, but not in one place together. There's a society, but there is no one in common. The moment is commonly held and it isn't. We are commonly held and we aren't. Many of us are in holding pens that only some of us chose. Many of us are scrambling for something the size of the world. Many have folded <clears throat> into their bodies and other airless spaces. Meanwhile, you're all learning now to live like cancer patients, defensively. So that's part of um, testing positive for the funk. This is a, um, a piece that we're working on from Lauren's writing, Lauren Ballant's writing, as a monologue. So I'll read a section of that. <clears throat> How am I? In the literature, correlation is called comorbidity, which is what you say, not when the patient is dying, but when all of our knowledge together is failing. The blue sky mind understands it's moving through the space of perception. Sometimes one is of two minds, and sometimes one is of no mind. Sometimes one's mind is in an intermission from the ordinary swarm. Nothing is an answer to how am I? I know it's a question I want answered to. I too want to know as I wait for my plasma to thaw. In the Mumbai hospital rooms, my friend Harris describes, when breathing machines are lifelines, when the body can't do it on its own, the doctors and the intimates wait. And while they wait, they document, they chart, they take field notes. Even the intubated patient writes on the legal pad to keep participating in life. Play and jokes move through the hall and the rooms like spiked music. Some people bring food from home to entice the sick one back to life through smells. Some people want street food to regulate their anxiety clock. Eyes flutter and there are prayers, snipes, quips and eruptions of remember whens. There is also crying and love pouring all through all kinds of movement towards the bed. And everyone remains attuned to the slow-mo pulling out of the rug from under what life was. Here, nothing diverts attention from treatment time, medicine, monitoring, consulting. Prognosis develops, dissolves in the intensities of the final meanwhile, until swiftly it's in front of the nose. The doctors can only do 
so much. The dynamic that produces inattention and occasionally some startling clarity might not lead to the version of healing that everyone hopes for. What is the hope? To pull this injury into the past? To make it an episode with no effects apart from the memory of expense, panic, exhaustion, belief, and a few comic moments? To make it an emergency with a beginning, middle, and comic end, involving no loss but a surprising better? I feel better. What looked like the dirty suntan of a high fever was actually a flush in nature. What looked like depletion was actually a butterfly at rest. And I'm gonna close by reading um, a small domestic scene that I wrote without Lauren's help this time. I'm making soup when the neighbor arrives. A butternut squash was one thing, now it's in pieces. The kettle whispers its readiness. I pivot to make her ginger tea. The airborne steam carries the scent of ginger before I can hand her the warmed cup. The chopping is almost done, then it's done. We inquire about this daughter and that daughter and this daughter, and then she adds, her cancer has returned. That's not good, I say. The kitchen smells of ginger, curry, and onions. What can you do, she asks. This rhetorical figure has pulled up a chair between us, wearing neither hyperbole nor understatement. Maybe it's the personification of disheartened defeat or passive re resignation. Maybe it's the false floor after treatment, after chemo, after yesterday. I pull out the blender and she asks if I don't, if I don't have a handheld one. Now I'm across the kitchen from where she sits. Her voice comes to me from further away, from the region of inquiry that blocks emotion in favor of the matter of blenders, the efficiency of objects. All the feelings in the kitchen fear expression. My mouth fails to open. I'm shaking my head. My hands are full, weighted down by the wrong one. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to introduce Doug, who the beloved Doug, who I admire so much. And this introduction will have nothing to do with all that he has published and all that he has um, garnered in terms of accolades over his um, fantastic poetic career, which continues. This is a story I, I, um, I came across as I was um, thinking about introducing Doug. And it's a story about Doug's diagnosis. And um, as the story goes, as I hear Doug tell it, the day he was going to um, get tested, um, his AIDS test, he ran into Jory. And Jory um, asked him, actually, if he had been tested. And he said, um, not yet, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to be tested. And she said um, that she would, she, she did not um, technically um, believe in um, the structures of religion as we know it, but she was going to pray for him. That was the story I read, Doug. I hope it's accurate in some form. Um, and I thought this is a, a, a way of bridging time that we've gone from that diagnosis to this day to that moment in time, to this moment in time. So Doug, take it away in this moment in time. Thank you, Claudia. It's so great to get to read with you. I remember when we read uh, in New York right after 9-11 um, and you were working on those amazing poems that became Don't Let Me Be Lonely. I remember you taking the stage at the New School and singing 
come Mr. Taliban, bring us bin Lada. And it was just, you know, um, powerful, powerful. Um, yes, well, this is not my first time at a pandemic. Um, I am uh, living through one and living in the midst of another. This poem is entitled Elegy on Fire. I noticed um, in the summertime, 4th of July started very early uh, this past year. Uh, people started setting off their fireworks in California in March <laughs> and they just kept going. And even after 4th of July, they kept going. Um, and, you know, we're a state that catches fire like that. So um, naturally, I was worried about things burning. Um, and one day I was uh, in the bathtub and um, I heard an alarm going off. It turned out to be a car alarm, but I thought it was a fire alarm. And I got out of the bath and I wrote this poem. Because that's what you do when you can't just put out a fire. It's called Elegy on Fire. I escaped from a building on fire with only my jeans pulled on and not even shoes on my feet as I stood there thinking of that Peggy Lee song, is that all there is? A stranger put a blanket on me. I wasn't on fire and didn't need to be put out, but it was clear I needed comfort of some sort and a human in the vicinity gave it. This is a 4th of July tale, the hazards of smoldering ordinance in the dumpster next to the kitchen window, the careless casual way we toss live ammo in the air, and golly gee, ain't that a shimmerer, ain't that a beaut, my father would say, who grew up in the land of fireworks and taught me before I could walk and talk the way to light a fuse is Hold it with your fingernails. So if it burns fast, it might burn you, but it won't explode. And always immerse the shells in water after, just in case. He who loved bombs went to Nam, collected guns. I always thought like poets come out with collected poems. My father should come out with collected guns. But now he's buried in Saipan, though I think he'd appreciate, appreciate the way my humor bombs sometimes. A weeping willow, he said, looking up at the sky while the bombs were bursting in air. What would he make of this display of affection years after we ran out of things to say? And what would he make of this country he served and questioned at the same way we love and don't love our parents who are after all just grown kids a little smarter than us perhaps, but not by much, especially when they vote. I want to wake up the neighbors the way they once woke me, the buildings on fire, get out, get out. I want to have already rebuilt after patriotism has hurled its sparklers in the trash and scorched us all. On my way home on base, I'd hear retreat on the public address and stand at attention as it played out over the Quonset huts and fences, over the bombers that stood on alert, and the supersonic reconnaissance craft, and the boys playing stickball, unexploded ordnance left over from a previous war, the tripwires crossed the fields like spider silk, but finer. I put my hand over my heart. I put my heart over my head. I loved, in the midst of war, the war's music, the Iliad lay on my bunk open to the body of Hector on his shield. I was a boy, it was an island. It was far from home, but it was quarters and soldiers, beaches of white sand and boy, the fireworks, they broke into a thousand threads cascading over the fields of Troy. But then I woke in a city on fire. And when I went to carry my father out, he was already on a pyre, he lit himself. It's a wonder the rest of us got out. I wanted to share a poem uh, 
by an elder, um, someone who has written before this time to show that uh, in every time we are challenged by what we call power and courage. Um, this is by Audrian Rich. It's entitled Power. Living in the earth deposits of our history. Today, a backhoe divulged out of a crumbling flank of earth. One bottle, amber, perfect, a hundred year old cure for fever or melancholy, a tonic for living on this earth in the winters of this climate. Today, I was reading Madame Curie. She must have known she suffered from radiation sickness, her body bombarded for years by the element she had purified. It seems she denied to the end the source of the cataracts on her eyes, the cracked and separating skin of her finger ends till she could no longer hold a test tube or a pencil. She died a famous woman denying her wounds, denying her wounds, denying her wounds came from the same source as her power. Honest to God, this is like the best poetry lineup in the world right now. I am so honored and tickled to be in the same room with these amazing writers. And I have the pleasure to introduce Forrest Gander. Um, the author of Eye to Eye, Science and Steeple Flower, and my all-time favorite title for a book and one of my favorite books, Deeds of Utmost kind Kindness. Um, this is a short poem by Forrest. It's entitled Meditative. Strange that we come to worship silence as an aesthetic activity, a gift that we draw it to the heart of our spiritual zone. Let silence ripen there with its absences of gesture in the ungulate night. Silence's anniversary of our penetration. Please welcome Forrest Gander. Thank you, thank you, Dad. Doug and I live close to each other, but I haven't seen him during this whole pandemic or the laws. Um, regarding the illness of the body, these poems I'm going to read first are from It Must Be a Misunderstanding, a book of tenderness written by the major Mexican poet Coral Bracho of her mother dying of Alzheimer's. Observaciones. Las piezas de rompecabezas se pierden, pero no la mirada que lo sabe suyo. Las formas, los objetos se funden, se desmoronan, pero el sentido de conjunto persiste entre momentos, entre ficciones, bajo fracturas incesantes, como un umbral, un asedero. Observations. The puzzle pieces get lost, but not the look she knows to be hers. The forms, the objects, they merge, they crumble, but a feeling for the ensemble remains. Between moments, between fictions, despite constant fractures, like a threshold, a handhold. Observations. That bird dropping down to peck the asphalt so close to her foot is something she has never encountered before. There's nothing to compare it with, nothing that links it to the cat, nothing it shares with that bush. They're all unanticipated tenants, convincing presences in a space that for the moment we share with them. There aren't kingdoms that harbor them or separate them out into their particular territories, no words, 
that link them together. This thing here, fluttering its wings now and hopping between the grass and the dust, it has no likeness. Alzheimer's follow up. Who is the president of this country? Well, it depends. For some, it's one person. For others, it's someone else. What is this called? I don't know, doctor, because I don't use that. Only you do. How many children do you have? Quite a few. What did you used to do? Now you're going to ask me to draw a clock. Did you like to dance? Yes, of course I danced. And did you ever travel? Yes, naturally. Where to? Well, to the same place everyone went. And now some poems of my own from Twice Alive. This is titled Albaid for those including my mother taken during the pandemic. Albaid. Can you hear dawn edging close? Hear soft light with its vacuum fingertips gripping the bedroom wall. An understated what? Exhilaration? Can you hear the voices, if they can be called voices, of toeys scratching in the garden and then the creaky low husky voice flecked with sleep beside you in bed, telling a dream slowly as though in real time. And now interrupting that dream, can you make out the voice, if it can be called a voice of absence speaking intimately to you directly, using the names of those who are vulnerable, those who are gone, I know you must hear it feelingly, a low vibration in your bones, for don't you find yourself absorbed in a next moment beyond your given life. Unto ourselves. Even when we realized we'd stopped in every essential way stopped moving forward. When we came to see we were descending even more tightly bound to the vortex as images rushed by in front of us and a blue whale rotted on the sand in Bolinas its stink drifting southward where dozens of barnacled 40 foot grays dead from starvation began to hulk against the shore, the white tufted foreheads of waves smashing against those knolls of oily decomposing flesh. It was everywhere we looked if we cared to look out over the bite sized squares of cheese and Saintsbury wine into the hum taking place under a coved moon, or cared to listen to clumped wild rye shushing the dunes while pulverized rock shrieked along fault lines in decibels so muted only the soles of our feet conducting the ground's sound up into our tally could register what was happening right there where our lives had been cut off from themselves and become something else drained of substance, steeped in the privilege against which we protested with those we called our friends, the ones who lately seemed to contract backward from our greetings, giving us to suspect that they too sensed something askew, the skip at the center of ourselves, or just an inkling of abyssal unhappiness was it, concentrated into the early evenings, like one of those spectral white fallow deer introduced to the headlands that began to outcompete native species. And so before they were slaughtered every one by hired hunters, inciting arguments about what was native if all systems are given to change. Maybe our ear twitches, maybe the deer's ear twitches, but we still can't make out in the dimness what we're looking at, can we? Nor is there interim from the tumult of incoming, the masticating chores, ping-pings begging immediate response, the sheer overabundance of the present shame, which plugs up each minute and stands in now 
for whatever it meant to live oneself before every gesture became performance for an audience we imagine never to be finished with looking at us. And as for the budding out of being we'd called passion or the sensual moments phrased into our gate when we were coming to feel something, when our shadows merged, not as romance, but the real consequence of our mutuality with shadows of conifers along the steep ravine and completely naked and without relief, the world parsed us into the inhuman where rosette lichen surged across rocks lacking nothing that might be needed to answer for our existence. By now, some of us outmaneuvered by the economy were lying around Dolores Park like fallen fruit. Others found themselves receptive to a trivial self-justifying kindness. What with coral belching up its algae, the constellations receding, the awakened tundra, how could we bear, we wondered to each other, even the weight of our own sorry initiatives. Life, someone countered, is pure gratuitous magnitude. Just look, the light is there, grace itself. But it was already noon. And as we looked, the colors of the hills began to blanch. And all around us, in the field of the visible, we sensed, without speaking, duration's ebb. And then maybe this last um, short poem uh, with a video. Post-fire forest, shadows of shadows without canopy, phalanxes of carbonized trunks and snags, their inner momentum shorted out. They surround us in early morning like plutonic pillars, like mute clairvoyance leading a sursum corda, like the excrescence of some long slaughter. All that moves is mist lifting too indistinct to be called ghostly. From scorched mycelial layers of rain moistened earth, what remains of the forest takes place in the exclamatory mode. Cindered utterances in a tongue from which everything trivial has been volatilized. Everything trivial to fire. In a notch between near hills, stubbled with black paroxysm, we spot a familiar sun, liquid glass globed at the blowpipe's tip. If this landscape is dreaming, it must dream itself awake. You have, everyone notes, a rare talent for happiness. I wonder how to value that walking through wreckage. On the second day, a black-backed woodpecker answers your call, but we search until twilight without finding it. So I'd like to um, introduce Victoria Chang, um, who is a fellow California writer um, and one of Copper Canyon's signal poets. She followed her powerful book, Barbie Chang, which came out in 217, with Obit in 220, a book that meant a lot to me, a book that plums not only grief, but the welter of motions, including humor that swirls inside of loss. Um, she writes um, about unknowingness, something that St. John of the Cross also wrote about. St. John of the Cross writes, Entre me donde no supe, I entered into unknowingness in Chang's term and remained there without knowing. She writes about the loss, a loss which isn't limited to our species, but also takes in space, feeling, earthly events, and of course, language itself. Victoria. Thank you. Um, for everything uh, so far. Thank you, Jory, for inviting me to be part of this amazing lineup. Um, thank you to 
Claudia, Doug, Jericho, and Forrest. Um, such an honor to be reading with all of you. Um, I am going to, and that introduction was incredible, Jory, it was really beautiful. I'm gonna read, um, start with a, a poem by Audrey Lord from this great anthology that I've been reading, edited by Roxanne Gay. Um, and this poem is called A Litany for Survival. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going in the hours between dawns, looking inward and outward at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths so their dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who were imprinted with fear like a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hope to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of an indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. Um, I will read a few poems from uh, my book, Obit, and there's uh, not much you really need to know except that my mother passed away um, of pulmonary fibrosis, which is a really long and brutal disease where your lungs gradually um, harden and then you suffocate to death. And then my father, who is a ghost throughout my poems in my life is, um, has uh, had a stroke a, a long time ago and suffers from aphasia. And these are shaped like small obituaries. We could see them. Grief. Grief as I knew it died many times. It died trying to reunite with other lesser deaths. Each morning I lay out my children's clothing to cover their grief. The grief remains, but is changed by what it is covered with. A picture of oblivion is not the same as oblivion. My grief is not the same as my pain. My mother was a mathematician, so I tried to calculate my grief. My father was an engineer, so I tried to build a box around my grief, along with a small wooden bed that grief could lie down on. The texts kept interrupting my grief, forcing me to speak about nothing. If you cut out a rectangle of a perfectly blue sky, no clouds, no wind, no birds, frame it with a blue frame, place it face up on the floor of an empty museum with an open atrium to the sky, that is grief. This one's called Victoria Chang. Victoria Chang died unwillingly on April 21st, 2017, on a cool day in Seal Beach, California, on her way back from the facility named Sunrise, which she often mistakenly called Sunset. Her father's problems, now her problems, nailed to her frontal lobe. Like a typist, she tried to translate his problems, carry the words back in a pony carriage one by one. When the pony moved, the letters strung together to form sentences, but when the pony refused to move, the carriage disappeared. The letters tagged her and ran into the cornfields. The police came and shined their lights onto the field, started shooting the letters, even though they had their hands up. Sometimes they shot the letters twice, just to make sure. Sometimes they shot them in the back. When we shoot a letter once, it's called typing. 
twice, engraving. When someone dies, letters are always engraved. When someone dies, there is a constant feeling of wanting to speak to someone, but the plane with all the words is crossing the sky. And um, I'll just read two more. This one's called Blame. Blame wants to die, but cannot. Its hair is untidy, but it's always here. My mother blamed my father. I blamed my father's dementia. My father blamed my mother's lack of exercise. My father is the story, not the storyteller. I eventually blamed my father because the story kept on trying to become the storyteller. Blaine has no face. I have walked on its staircase around and around, trying to slap its face, but only hitting my own cheeks. When some people suffer, they want to tell everyone about their suffering. When the brush hits a knot, the child cries out loud, makes a noise that is an expression of pain, but not the pain itself. I can't feel the child's pain, but some echo of her pain based on my imagination. Blame is just an echo of pain, a veil across the face of the one you blame. I blame God. I want to complain to the boss of God about God. What if the boss of God is rain and the only way to speak to rain is to open your mouth to the sky and drown? And I'll read one more, um, which is the, uh, the only poem in the book that was a, a prompt actually from Derek Sheffield of uh, terrain.org for his Letters to America series. And um, this poem references the Marjorie Stoneman shooting in Florida. America. America died on February 14th, 2018. And my dead mother doesn't know. Since her death, America has died a series of small deaths, each one less precise than the next. My tears are now shaped like hooks, but my heart is damp still. If it is lucky, it is in the middle of its beats. The unlucky dead children hold telegrams they must hand to a woman at a desk. The woman will collect their belongings in shadows. My dead mother asks each of these children if they know me, have seen me, how tall my children are now. They will tell her that they once lived in Florida, not California. She will see the child with a hole in his head. She will blow the dreams out of the hole like dust. I used to think death was a kind of anesthesia. Now I imagine long lines, my mother taking in all the children. I imagine her touching their hair, how she might tickle their knees to make them laugh. The dead hold the other half of our ticket. The dead are an image of wind. And when they comb their hair, our trees rustle. Thank you. And now I'm uh, super excited to introduce the uh, singular Jericho Brown, whose book, The Tradition, won the Pulitzer Prize and has also written several other books, The New Testament and Please. And um, I think Jericho is, is one of our most vibrant and necessary poets writing today. And it's such an honor to read with Jericho. So um, welcome Jericho. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, thanks to everyone. Um, what a day. Uh, this is a poem by Lucille Clifton, Dialysis. After the cancer, the kidneys refused to continue. They closed their thousand eyes. Blood fountains from the blind man's arm and decorates the tile today. Somebody mops it up. The woman who is over 90 cries for her mother. If our dead were here, they would save us. We are not supposed to hate the dialysis unit. We are not supposed to hate the universe. This is not supposed to happen to me. After the cancer, the body refused to lose anymore. Even the poisons were claimed and kept until they threatened to destroy the heart they loved. In my dream, a house is burning. Something crawls out of the fire, cleansed and purified. In my dream, 
I call it light. After the cancer, I was so grateful to be alive. I am alive and furious. Blessed be even this. And uh, these are some of my poems. Duplex. I begin with love, hoping to end there. I don't want to leave a messy corpse. I don't want to leave a messy corpse full of medicines that turn in the sun. Some of my medicines turn in the sun. Some of us don't need hell to be good. Those who need most need hell to be good. What are the symptoms of your sickness? Here is one symptom of my sickness. Men who love me are men who miss me. Men who leave me are men who miss me in the dream where I am an island. In the dream where I am an island, I grow green with hope. I'd like to end there. Another elegy. This is what our dying looks like. You believe in the sun. I believe I can't love you. Always be closing, said our favorite professor before he let the gun go off in his mouth. I turned 29, the way any man turns in his sleep, unaware of the earth moving beneath him, its plates in their places, a dated disagreement. Let's fight it out, baby. You have only so long left, a man turning in his sleep. So I take a, pic a picture. I won't look at it, of course. It's his bad side, his Mr. Hyde, the hole in a husband's head, the O of his wife's mouth. Every night I take a pill, miss one and I'm gone, miss two and we're through. Hotels bore me unless I get a mountain view a room in which my cell won't work and there's nothing to do but see the sun go down into the ground that cradles us as any coffin can. Heart condition. I don't want to hurt a man, but I like to hear one beg. Two people touch twice a month in ten hotels and we call it long distance. He holds down one coast. I wander the other like any African American. Africa with its condition and America with its condition and black folk born in this nation content to carry half of each. I shoulder my share. My man flies to touch me. Sky on our side. Sky above his world I wish to write which is where I go wrong. Words are a sense of sound. I get smart. My mother shakes her head. My grandmother sighs. He ain't got no sense. My grandmother is dead. She lives with me. I hear my mother shake her head over the phone. Somebody cut the cord. We have a long distance relationship. I lost half of her to a stroke. God gives to each a body. God gives every body its pains. When pain mounts in my body, I try thinking of my white forefathers who hurt their black bastards quite legally. I hate to say it, but one pain can ease another. Doctors, rather, I take pills. My man wants me to see a doctor. What are you when you leave your man wanting? What am I now that I think so fondly of airplanes? What's my name? Whose is it while we make love? My lover leaves me with words I wish to write, flies from one side of a nation to the outside of our world. I don't want the world. I only want African sense of American sound, him touching.
this body aware of its pains. Greetings, earthlings, my name is slow and stumbling. I come from planet trouble. I am here to love you, uncomfortable. This is a poem by Lucille Clifton. Speaking of loss, I began with everything. Parents, two extra fingers, a brother to ruin. I was a rich girl with no money in a red dress. How did I come to sit in this house wearing a name I never heard until I was a woman? Someone has stolen my parents and hidden my brother. My extra fingers are cut away. I am left with plain hands and nothing to give you but poems. Uh, big thanks to you, Jory. Thank you to everyone for this reading. Thank you. Thank you. It's uh, um, um, I think I, I don't know how to thank the Brooklyn Rail for asking me to gather together uh, this group of poets who brought such medicine in this moment. Um, sitting here with chills and with tears, I assume the audience is feeling the same way. Um, I really see no reason to, um, to ask you any uh, questions because you would be speaking in prose over these poems. Uh, I would remind our listeners and today that all these books are available, many books by these poets are available, that poetry is this astounding medicine. Um, share it, read it. Um, I um, thank you all for coming here. I would point out that the Brooklyn Rail has an incredible series of uh, readings on YouTube that are available, not just the radical poetry readings, which happen all the time, but daily conversations with visual artists, with art historians, with poets, and it's an incredible resource and it's right there on YouTube. So I just thank you. Can we please um, have a gallery view and give a hand applause to our, our incredible poets? I really don't know how to thank you enough. This has been incredible. Thank you so much, Jory. Um, and uh, if it's all right, in a moment, I'll sort of invite everyone to turn on their microphones so that we can do the big applause. Um, but I, I just wanted to say, uh, you know, this has just been fantastic. Thank you all so much. We're like really undone. Um, thank you so much to Claudia who had to leave, Victoria, Jericho, Doug, Forrest, and of course, Jory. Uh, thank you for bringing this all together uh, and us all together today. And thank you to everyone who tuned in, in the audience and in the chat. Um, we're celebrating the Rails 20th anniversary this year. It's like a very long birthday party. So as a nonprofit, if you enjoy today's program, please consider making a donation to Keeping the Rail and our special projects free, relevant, and independent. Um, and as Jory mentioned, you know, we do these events daily and We'd love if you could join us again tomorrow when we welcome back Dr. Elizabeth Bishop in conversation with Damaris Dunn, Tene Howard, Carmelin P. Malalis, and Dr. Yolanda Seely Ruiz for a roundtable on radical healing. Uh, we'll close that out with a reading by poet Kwame Opokuduku. Um, and, you know, other than that, um, you know, this has been absolutely fantastic and thank you all so much. Uh, I'm going to send you all an invite to turn on your microphones if you'd like. Um, but yeah, this is. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jory. Thank you. Jory. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jory. Thank you, Jory. Thank you, Thank you, Jory. Thank you, Jory. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Jory. Thank you, Thank you, so much, Thank you, Thanks, Victoria. Thank you, 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 Thank you,